Hello and welcome to another episode of The Traveling Podcast, the podcast that inspires you to travel and learn about the world. And in today's episode, we are going to visit one of the best cities Europe has to offer, Berlin. It's going to be fun. Today, I have a very special guest on the show. He is a local guide from Berlin and a true Berliner. We are going to discuss the rich history of Berlin and what made it into what it is today, which is a fun city to visit that has a lot to offer to any kind of visitor. Holger specializes in the culinary tours of the city, so we are going to discuss a lot about the food scene of the city, and I hope you guys are hungry. And Holger will share with you the must-visit places of Berlin and, of course, some great hidden gems. So, ladies and gentlemen, give a warm welcome to Holger. All right. Hello, Holger. How are you? Hey, Motek. I'm great. Thank you. How are you? I'm super. I'm very excited about this episode because I want to tell you I had the privilege to visit Berlin uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, it's a funny story. I finished uh, a bicycle trip uh, through Belgium and the Netherlands, and I didn't know what to do next. And uh, a friend of mine told me that she has a, an uncle living in Kreuzberg, and he's looking for mm-hmm. someone to uh, uh, house-sitting, house-set his uh, apartment to take uh, <laughs> care of his two cats. And I said, yeah. you know, Berlin, yeah. why not? Uh, mm-hmm. I came there. You know, uh, taking care of cats is quite of an easy job. It's not like taking care of uh, dogs or children. And uh, I had a free apartment for about a month in the heart of Kreuzberg. And it was super awesome. I didn't know anything, almost anything about Berlin, except of its uh, history. Um, And most people, when they think about Berlin, they think first thing in its history about like the Second World War and stuff like that. So that's what I had in mind. But then when I arrived to Berlin, first of all, I was in shock. I was in shock of how this city Mm. attracts so many young people, how it's such a multicultural city. I met people from all over the world uh, who came to Berlin for not just a week or two, for an extended period. And... uh, it was great. It was so great. I remember when I met the guy, I, uh, you know, I, I kept the apartment for him. I asked him, so uh, what is the vibe here? How is Berlin? And he said, every day is a weekend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is, this is something you can really say. Yeah, But, you know, um, Berlin, the city has changed so much since you've been here. I mean, the last 10, 15 years have been so important for the Berlin that you see today. So even when you come back now, after 10, 11 years, you will experience a different vibe. And yeah, every day is a weekend. It's also a city that never sleeps. And uh, Berlin offers you so many things. And if you, if you want to dive into, into the, the, the recent history, let's say the last 150 years, really Berlin offers you everything. Because Berlin always played an important role in everything that happened in those in those last years and if you want to go 800 years back there was no berlin you know there was there was this tiny little spot on the map nobody would consider you then you go to paris or to london or to rome to see the history of the mid ages or or even longer ago berlin is just you know berlin is today and berlin is changing every day so where is uh, berlin i mean where it is located obviously in germany but where in germany yeah you know, Berlin is the eastern border of Germany. So, you know, the Polish border is much closer than any border in the West. So I hope you didn't bicycle, come, came by bike from the Netherlands, because that's quite far. You know, when you live, when you, when you want to live in Central Europe, you go to Cologne or to Frankfurt. Then within one hour, you're in Brussels and then, or in Amsterdam. Mm. In Berlin, you're, you're closer to Poland, actually. You're, you're, you're really uh, uh, in the eastern border of, of Germany, but also Berlin is the center of East Germany. And Berlin has uh, two rivers. There's the River Spree and the River, River Havel. And this is, this is something also very important. Berlin is not this 
this super metropolitan area where lots of cities around Berlin. Berlin is unique and then around it there's nothing because it was bordered mm. because of Berlin's unique history in the last 30 years that, uh, you know, West Berlin was in the middle of East Germany and then West Berlin and East Berlin together became this huge city again just uh, uh, 34 years ago. But uh, also there's no suburbia. Mm. You know, that, you know that, and that's why Berlin, you're so close to nature they're so close to water berlin has so much things to offer in summer yeah right now we're in winter in winter berlin can be quite cold quite gray and very dark and a bit dirty <laughs> because of the, the 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 yeah because of the climate but you know berlin is a summer city and what you did was completely perfect come in june spend a month here see how the, the city is blossoming up and you know everything is happening outside because we have so cold and gray winters and then when the sun comes up and you know the, the the days are getting longer berlin is a beautiful place and it's really this is something yes we are we're a little bit far away from all the metropolitan areas of central and western europe but berlin is a metropolitan area itself i remember i remembered it it's very green uh, it's very um it has a lot of space um how many people live yeah. in berlin today no we're getting close to 3.8 million no so, so it's it's Germany's biggest city by far. Um, Hamburg and Munich are coming far uh, after Berlin, but uh, you know that uh, Berlin used to have four point four million people. Really? So uh, in in the nineteen thirties, Berlin was six hundred thousand people more than today. Really? Wow! And that all changed because of the war. Yes. Yes. Mm. I mean, of course, in the Second World War, a lot of people had to leave and then after after second world war berlin didn't boom again especially west berlin because you know west berlin was politically very important but berlin was a city without money you didn't come to west berlin because you wanted to make money but because we wanted to live a free life and this is what you had in kreuzberg because where you stayed in kreuzberg that was the eastern border of west berlin so in those days this was the end of the world literally and you lived in squats, you lived, you didn't pay a lot of rent, you didn't pay a lot for your life. And this is where West Berlin started, and then the war fell. It was 19, 1989, and um, West Berlin was then, together with East Berlin, a city with even less money. So that was, I mean, this was like really the first decade after the reunification. Berlin was a very free and fun city because there was so much space, there was so much potential. You could grow, you could do almost everything. And of course, this is changing today. I know that uh, Berlin is uh, more or less in the same size of um, of uh, London, which you know it's it's big. But uh, in London, I think there are maybe eight or nine million people living there. So it's like the same size, yeah. only half or even even less than half of the population of London. Now let's uh, go back and yeah. say how did uh, Berlin start uh, like as a city when I mean when did it start and how did it evolve uh, throughout history I mean you can really say that Berlin the first time was mentioned in the 13th century it was 1273 so a long time back then it was a small village of fishermen and you can really say the first hundreds of years Berlin was not that important it was just in the 18th century that Berlin and Prussia you know there was don't never mix Prussia and Russia. I mean, they were neighbors, <laughs> but not the same. But Berlin be was the capital of this German state. You know, there was no Germany then. Germany just united in the late 19th century. And until then, Berlin was a small little capital. And then in the late 18th century, Frederick the Great made Berlin a place on the map and made Prussia a place on the map. But this all then, uh, Napoleon crashed everything in the beginning of the 19th century. And then uh, Berlin started to become, with the Industrial Revolution, become a center. But only 1871, when Germany was united and Prus the Prussians led this unification process. So Berlin became capital of this new Germany. And that's only 1871. Suddenly Berlin was, wow, we're here. No. And then... The boom started. You know, before Berlin had 400,000 people, 400, 450,000 people, while London already had 3 million. Wow. And then Berlin grew from 18, 1815, 1860 to the, the late 1920s, early 1930s, from 400,000 to 4.5 million. Wow. 
What a boom. So 11, yeah, 11 times the people in only 80 years. So you can really say that Berlin exploded and became this capital of Europe. And you can really say in the, in the late 1920s, it was the, I always say, it's the capital of sex, drugs, and cabaret. Yes. No rock and roll then. But also the city where Albert Einstein moved. You know, Albert Einstein came from, from Switzerland and moved to Berlin in the 1920s because Berlin, the Humboldt University, was the only place where he can conduct his research. And so you see, Berlin was coming out of the, the catastrophe of the First World War Going into the even bigger catastrophe of Second World War, in between, there was this little democratic thing we called the Weimar Republic. Mm -hmm. And in those days, Berlin was really a hub of the world. Yeah. It's interesting that uh, even though the economical situation in Germany uh, after the First World War was catastrophic, uh, Berlin thrived. Like it was a center for culture, for art, for science. Uh, you mentioned mm. cabaret. I know that the roots of the German cinema started at that time uh, and later on in the 1930s also uh, evolved. But in the 1920s, uh, directors like Fritz Young, uh, who later mm. uh, moved to the U.S. and, you know, became just a Hollywood director. But all of that really, like Berlin was a hustling and bustling city. And uh, mm. that's how I like to, rem to have uh, the picture of Berlin in my mind. That's how I remember it uh, from mm. my visit there. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, Berlin yeah. uh, comes in the 1930s with the uh, uprising of the Nazis. And um, I, think, I think I heard somewhere that uh, even um, Hitler didn't really like Berlin. He said that it was like... A... Oh, he hated it. Yeah. He hated the city. It was the last city where he had the majority of votes. You know, never forget Hitler got voted. He got elected. You're right. You know? But, you know, Hitler came, from, Hitler came from Munich. Southern Germany, Bavaria was his, his homeland. He started in the, in the early 1920s in Munich and then realized, oh, I have to go. I can't go against uh, the, the state, so I have to go through the institutions of the state. And then he started... His campaign when the when the happy days in the 1920s stopped, you know, we always speak about the roaring, of the golden 1920s, but that was only from 24 to 29, mm -hmm. because 29, I mean, before we had the biggest inflation that the world ever saw, yeah. and then we uh, in, 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 then we had financed with American money a boom, and the boom ended with the uh, depression crash in New York in October and the depression in 29, mm -hmm. and then Hitler came out and said, "Hello." I'm back. And then he got elected because he said, okay, now, now the people are ready for my, for my messages and for the things that I have to say. But Berlin was the last place. And, you know, Berlin was the last battlefield for him. And you know that Berlin, the name is Old Slavic and mm. says Swamp. Swamp. <laughs> so his capital, his capital named after a Slavic name, he was the biggest fan of the Slavic culture. Oh, know? of course. Of course he was. That's why he always uh, said, oh, I have to rename Berlin into Germania. Mm, yeah. Tear down the whole city and build something bigger. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sure. So, yes, that's why Hitler, you know, uh, Berlin was too communist, too left, too, too poor. Berlin, of course, during the war uh, was bombarded and destroyed. And, you know, every, I think a lot of uh, our viewers and listeners have these uh, pictures in their, in their heads of uh, bombarded Berlins and all of the destroyed uh, buildings. Yeah. And, the, and then Berlin um, entered into uh, an era, a new phase that lasted uh, until uh, 1989. And that's when it was split to... Indeed, yeah, yes. was split to West Berlin and East Berlin. And I must say that um, even today, uh, fast forward years later, you have that separation, not in a physical sense, there is no uh, wall, but people refer to East Berlin and West Berlin. So can you explain to the audience yeah. how, Berlin, yeah. how Berlin is situated on the map, kind of? Yeah. First, uh, Berlin was divided after Second World War. First, Germany was divided in four sectors, four allied powers, Britain, France, America, and the Soviet Union. So Germany was divided in four sectors. And also the capital, Berlin, was divided in four sectors. And then 
the, the, the three Western allies, they formed West Germany. So the French, British and American part of Germany became West Germany and the Soviet sector became East Germany. And then also the three Western allied sectors of Berlin became West Berlin and the Soviet sector became East Berlin. So the wall was in the end between the three Western allied sectors and the Soviet sector. So this was the situation between, let's say, 49 between 45 and 49, I mean, the years after the war, mm -hmm. the, 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 the Germany settled down. And then 49, the two states were formed, West Germany and East Germany, as independent states. And then Berlin became, West Berlin became this island in the middle of the Soviet, of the Soviet uh, sector because the Soviet yeah, got the eastern part of Germany. And Berlin was in the heart, like I explained before, Berlin was in the heart of East Germany. So West Berlin, the three Western allied sectors, were, were isolated. Yeah. And that's what I said. The eastern border of West Berlin was the most eastern part of the western, of the capitalistic world and like the, the needle in the flesh of the Soviets and the East Germans. Yeah. It's important to emphasize on it because uh, I didn't know it. I think a lot of people think in their imagination that the border, the actual border between the Soviet world and the western world was right there at the heart of Berlin, where there was a border there, but Berlin, West Berlin was an island state, you can say, or an island city yeah. in all of a larger area, which was Eastern yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Germany. And uh, in 1989, uh, the wall uh, uh, falls down. <laughs> I don't remember it because I was born yeah. in 1989. <laughs> yes, but... Uh, oh, good for you. Thank you. But uh, I have, everybody knows those amazing and uh, like moving uh, videos of people, just random people coming with uh, sledgehammers and breaking the wall and uh, taking uh, pieces of the wall, uh, you know, as a, as a souvenir. As which, a uh, souvenir, yeah, exactly. Which today, uh, one of those souvenirs cost a yeah, lot of yeah. money. But everything that you can buy today is not real anymore no, because huh? they're all gone. Yeah. But this is really something you have to understand that but, I mean, there are really two systems came together. And this is why the, the, the merge between East and West really took a long time because people grew up. I grew up in West Berlin. I'm a born West Berliner. You know, I grew up in this, in this, uh, in this little island and there was a wall around this island. And then suddenly, you know, I was a student. I was, I was 20 when the wall came down already. I was in my first semester. And I was really, you know, there was, it was a Thursday night and, you know, we were out in the, with the, uh, the, the new colleagues, the new students, we were out, yeah, you, you drink a beer, you come home late. And I didn't live very far from this first checkpoint that was opening up and where all these East German cars were going through to West Berlin. So going from East Berlin to West Berlin. And I came out of the subway and saw all these East German cars coming. And I said, what? I mean, usually you don't have. East German cars in West Berlin. So I said, shit, something happened and I missed it. <laughs> I was too late. You know, there was no mobile phone, no internet in 89. So just run home and turn the TV and I said, oh my God. <laughs> it, was, it was really a big moment. And then you, you realize, oh my God, something is happening here. But you have to understand, everybody was afraid. In really? The first hours, the first days. Yeah, because what happened in Beijing just in summer before you had the massacres on the Tiananmen Square in mm. June, between June and August the same year. So nobody knew what will happen. Somebody would grab a machine gun and just shoot into the crowd. So like really, I mean, the first night, the West Berliners were just standing there and, and cheering everybody who came from east to west. But then, of course, the movement was, okay, now us West Berliners said, okay, let's do something. And then on the next day only, we were standing on the wall and cheering. And then these famous pictures come up because everybody was like, oh, my God, will you die standing on the wall? So it was it, it took its time. But then it was like the first day, the second and the third. And then West went East, East went West. Everybody was meeting, everybody was smiling. And this phase was was, I mean, the first year between when the wall came down on the 9th of November in 89. And then there was the political reunification on the October 90. So mm -hmm. there was one year where the state of East Germany still was there, but the state was falling apart. I mean, there were no, not really authorities. They, they had in March the first free elections in East Germany. And then the party started. And then, you know, the, everybody from East 
conquered these, I mean, all these spaces in East Berlin and did parties and all these courtyards and all these broken down factories. And that's the spirit that you still have a little bit in Berlin to, to like explore the big spaces and explore the potential that this, uh, this new city really is offering you. Wow, Holger, thank you. Thank you for sharing this. Uh, it's something uh, unbelievable. It's really a point in history that uh, really changed. Like Europe changed, the world changed, and uh, wow, that's amazing. I mean, this is really, I mean, Berlin changed the, city, the history in so many bad ways, you know? Right. When, when you see what, what, what happened in the First World War. Yes, of course, the Germans came out of like, just united, if, uh, just became a power inside of Europe. Yeah, we want our piece of the cake. We want our colonies. We want an army, we want a navy, and the cake was already taken. So the Germans tried to push in, first World War happens. And then Germany fell down and Berlin starts to grow again. And Berlin in the 1920s starts again showing its potential. And then, I mean, we had inflation, we had mass unemployment, big economical disaster. Hitler comes up from Berlin, destroying the world. Mm -hmm. So Berlin then again... Uh, in the in the Cold War was the center of the Cold War was the wall in east and west and also everybody says oh my god and Berlin is really like a, this is the border town of, of of another conflict and suddenly Berlin turns into the most peaceful pl place in the world where a revolution is happening without one shot nobody gets injured I mean despite I mean nobody gets killed right nothing nothing really happens a system is just falling apart I always say it was like Voldemort and the last Harry Potter movie you touch and boo, everything falls apart and suddenly you have this anarchy in the most positive way. One year at least where everybody's just running around smiling and having a, the greatest party in the world, you know? And this is what really, this is what Berlin uh, is, 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 is uh, what you see in Berlin today. There's so many things coming together and now since then so many people moved to the city. So you really have this thing that when you are in the center of Berlin, you hear more English than German. Yeah, I've noticed that. And you really have this, you know, you really have the situation like in Amsterdam, you know? Yeah. That uh, the, the, the working language in most of the companies is English today. Uh, now, if you see the scene, the culinary scene, the party scene, everything that is cultural in Berlin today, it's so not German anymore. I mean, not to say that it, this is something bad or good. There's no, you know, there's no value with it. But, you know, the, 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 the people that moved to Berlin in the last 30 years changed the city completely. I remember, like, when I got to Berlin, first of all, there are cities around the world that uh, they are fun, but they are also give you, gives you a warm welcome. They're accepting you. They're like, yeah, you don't need to be... Mm -hmm. According to like a certain standard, uh, you don't need to be American or uh, French or German. You just need to be you, and you can come here yeah. and you can work and enjoy and have a good time. I remember meeting a lot of people from all over the world on a daily basis. It's like uh, in in Hebrew there is a word called kibbutz, you know, like a commune. It's like you mm -hmm. you come and. And you, you, hey, where are you from? Oh, I'm from Portugal. Oh, I'm from Brazil. Oh, I'm from the US. I'm from France. And everybody comes together and like yeah. appreciate each other and uh, having a good time. It's uh, something very unique that uh, Berlin has to offer. Yeah, true, absolutely. And this is also when you when you when you go to a restaurant today. I mean, you most likely don't go to a German restaurant. I mean, most likely all the restaurants are open that in the last five years. Maybe five percent are German, like really on the traditional German way. You know, it's always this influence. It's what you have in Tel Aviv. All these people, all these na nations and, and 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 culinary scenes coming together and mixing. And I always say, yes, what you what you see in Tel Aviv is this melting pot of different cultures, and this is really nice to see. And you're absolutely right. The people come from all over the place. It's not, it's not the majority is American or the majority. So you hear Spanish, you hear English, you hear uh, Hebrew a lot on the streets of, yeah. of Berlin today. And it's so nice to see that the Jewish community in Berlin is the fastest growing in the world. Berlin, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are a lot of Israelis living in Berlin. Uh, that's also when I, I yeah. visited Berlin, uh, I met a few of them. And also I had a good friend uh, living there at that time. 
אולגר, let's talk mm-hmm. about the culinary scene. So for people who are listening, אולגר uh, also, uh, among many things, he guides also uh, culinary uh, tours. And uh, so I want to come to Berlin and of course experience uh, uh, everything, like it's uh, rich history and it's nightlife and food. So what can I find in uh, Berlin in these days? So I would probably, like I did last night, probably take you to a, a, a night out in Kreuzberg because now, right now, I mean, what the Kreuzberg that you saw 10 years ago is already a little bit gone. It's like, I mean, it's still there. You still have this rough West Berlin, the poor old West Berlin. Everybody would consider, okay, West Berlin is the commercial side and East Berlin is the poor old communist side. Right. No, it's the other way around. Really? West, the West Berlin part is more like the, the rough part where we, the, the people without money live and the East Berlin part is the new money. This is IT. This is the startup industry. So um, you go to Kreuzberg, where you stayed, like really the, the heart of Kreuzberg and there... You have the best culinary scene right now. If you open up a two Michelin star restaurant in Berlin these days, you most probably do this in Kreuzberg. Okay. And this is also like, and this is also because Kreuzberg is, um, uh, used to be already in the 60s, the biggest Turkish city outside of Turkey. Because after the wall fell, they needed to replace a lot of workers in a very short time. And so a lot of Turkish families moved to the city of West Berlin to replace these workers that were missing because the wall Cut, cut them off their jobs. And so Berlin became this huge Eastern Mediterranean, Middle Eastern hub, and then Lebanese, Syrian, North African, and Israeli culture. So this is what is very dominant in Berlin today is, like I said, Middle Eastern, Eastern Mediterranean food culture. And this is also like the, also the, the, the competition between Syrians, Arab, Turkish, and Israeli on a culinary way. I call it the hummus the war. The hummus wars, you know? exactly. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And, you know, and competitions, oh, we, competition is great for business in the end. So for us, it's like really to, to see like how the Turkish uh, culinary scene is just flourishing. And, you know, that, that we have one street that is pure in Turkish hand in Neukölln and one street that is pure in Arab hand. And this is really, you know... Uh, a little bit saying, okay, no, 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 come, come to our culinary world. And what the Syrians are doing with open fire and meat is just amazing. So this is one part that is so dominant and great about the Berlin food culture is coming from the Middle East. And then also what the, you know, what the Turkish were for uh, West Berlin, the Vietnamese were for East Berlin. So we have a very strong Vietnamese community. Also guest workers, that all the students that were invited from East Germany to study the new communist state of Vietnam was supported by East Germany. So we have a big Vietnamese community. And still today, this is one of my most, actually most favorite hubs is this, this old, the old ghetto, the Vietnamese ghetto in East Berlin. And there's this Don Xuan center. It's like different market halls. It's like really like a Hanoi market in Berlin. Wow. And there the street food, the, the, the really the Vietnamese street food still often done from Vietnamese for Vietnamese. So really, it's the bustling hub and it's so crazy to be there. And this is what I say. First, see Kreuzberg, see the Middle Eastern heart of Berlin and get all these, these flavors of the Middle Eastern cuisine from the Turkish, from the Arab, from the Israeli, from the North African background, and then go to the Vietnamese center in, in Lichtenberg, go to the Dong Xuan, and then you have like really two amazing melting pots of new Berlin culture. And this, is, and this is just very international. It's Eastern Asian and Middle Eastern culture. Wow, I'm hungry already. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, you know, Holger, I think first we should um, explain to the audience how, uh, like, what are the main areas of Berlin? Because you mentioned Kreuzberg, but there are others. Can we mm-hmm. say just a word about how, yeah. what they are? Sure. If we start with Kreuzberg, Kreuzberg is today at Kreuzberg and Friedrichshain. These are the, on two sides of the river Spree. Kreuzberg is Old West Berlin. Friedrichshain is Old East Berlin. Today they form one district, but this is just on the, on the, organizer, on the organizational side from the city. But these are the two party centers of East and West Berlin. Both sides on the, on the Spree connected by one beautiful bridge. 
but this is like really you go to Berghain or you go to the RAV area in Friedrichshain or you go to Kit Kat Club in Kreuzberg. And these are like, you know, these are the, the centers of the nightlife. And this is something you just you just go there, you follow the people, follow the masses in the end, and you find the right areas and the right clubs. But uh, this is, you know, for the nightlife. The cultural and political center is called center, Mitte. Mitte. You know, Germans in there, when you hear German names, a lot of times very practical, very functional. So the center of Berlin is called center. And the German word for center is Mitte. So this is why the central district is called Mitte. And there, there you have the political center, the cultural center, you have Museum Island. And also, this is also everything, something you have to see. Museum Island is the, the Louvre of Berlin. And this is what they are really doing these days. It's like renovating. It's a, it's a century project, like renovating Museum Island and one of the UNESCO World Heritage Buildings or World Heritage Sites. And this is really the, the, the cultural part, the museum part, the, the operas. We are the only city in the world with three opera houses. So we have six universities, three, op uh, no, five, five, six. Okay, don't want to say something wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But, you know, we have everything because we were f first one big city, then two cities, and that's why we have everything at least double. We are the city of zoos, actually. Did you know? No. We, the, West Berlin, the West Berlin Zoo is the one with the highest number of species, and the East Berlin Zoo is the largest zoo in the world. So there are two zoos in Berlin. Yeah, two very, very large zoos. So this is also something, if you come with your kids, if you come with the family, you can also have, like, beautiful days with your kids in the in like two very 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 unique uh, situations with lots of animals but uh, you have like i said Kreuzberg Friedrichshain and Mitte these are the, the the a little bit on the eastern side like eastern part of West Berlin and the heart of old East Berlin Friedrichshain and Mitte and then you have the more a little bit more residential areas then you go to Prenzlauer Berg This was the, the, the workers' district of East Berlin. Today, the most gentrified, highly luxury renovated, very, very beautiful residential neighborhood. No more party there, but great restaurants, a great culinary scene, and a really, really beautiful neighborhood. And then you could also go to the old center of West Berlin. And this is also very, very important. A lot of, a lot of touristic action takes place in East Berlin. And the, the old center of Berlin, that became the center of East Berlin. But the, the relatively new center of West Berlin, Charlottenburg and Schöneberg, these are also something every, every, every guest of Berlin should see and should get this, this other idea of Berlin, this other picture, this other... Uh, uh, yeah, really, like the, the old West Berlin that was falling into a big hole when everybody was facing each. You know, everybody was going to East Berlin. East Berlin was the thing that happens. Everybody thought, oh, West Berlin is boring. Yeah. But also since five years, there's the, the little bit of a renaissance of old West Berlin. And I have a lot of friends, Israeli friends, that actually all moved to the east. And now they're moving west because the east is now boring. And they said, okay, that's, we need something new. So we moved to the old city center of West Berlin, the districts of Schöneberg and Charlottenburg. Wow, you know, it's amazing you're saying it, because uh, when I was in Berlin, that's what uh, people told me. Oh, don't go to the western parts of Berlin, because that's the boring place. Go to the eastern parts. That's yeah, where yeah. the fun stuff is, is there. And uh, it's, uh, you see, the Berlin is a changing city. It doesn't stay the same, and uh, it's good to know. You know, nothing is really fixed. There's a, a famous quote, Berlin will never, will never be, will always become. Mm. You know, the city is so, so dynamic, has always gone up and down, you know, total catastrophes, total destruction, complete restart of a new system. And this is still, Berlin is still pressing the restart button constantly. And this is nice to see. And, and people, people are really adopting it. And this is nice. Kreuzberg is a center for uh, Middle Eastern uh, cuisine and Vietnamese. Um, Can I find other uh, interesting uh, like food centers or like food hubs in uh, Berlin? Of, and this is the point, there are too many to really point out something. And there's always this important question, Holger, what is your most favorite restaurant in Berlin? I don't have. Because, you know, every day it's a different one. 
You know, it's it's like if you're in New York. Of course, there are some places. Okay, I go there regularly, but just because you meet the right people there, not because the place is the best. Is there a best place? Not really. Is there, you know, is there one cuisine that I say this is the one that you really have to? There are so many. There's there are places that that are really nice because they are changing con constantly. There are some market halls. There's one market hall in Kreuzberg. You might have seen it, market hall number nine. It's a very, very famous spot, very hipster, very busy with the people on, on Thursday nights. They have a street food night, but it's wonderful because it's changing constantly. Always new stands, new kind of street food are coming. And this is, and this is what I like. You know, of course, there's this one French restaurant where I used to go, or I, I still go. It's like a, a French tapas place, small, small. It's actually a wine bar that's also offering bar food. But you know, you come there with a big group, with big friends, and you order everything on the menu. And then they bring it with wine. It's wonderful. But just because, you know, it's, it's the, the nice thing about coming with friends to a place and be surprised by wonderful food and also be surprised. You go around one corner. And suddenly a new place has opened. And it's a pop-up thing. It will be gone in two months. And, uh, and that's nice. I remember one of my best uh, culinary experiences in uh, Berlin uh, were in Kreuzberg. A friend, a local friend, took me to a Sudanese falafel place. And mm. uh, I don't know if it's still a thing there. It was 10 years ago. And, um, you know, because it's like you mentioned before with the hummus wars that uh, each nation says that they have the best hummus and yada, yada, yada. So uh, mm -hmm. falafel, it's a Mediterranean dish and it's very common where I come from. Uh, it's, it's the street mm. food here. Like it's something that you eat not on a daily basis, but it's like everywhere. And uh, she told me, I'm going to take you to this uh, falafel that you never tried before. You never had a falafel like that. And I was like, girl, who are you talking to? You know, like I'm a falafel <laughs> king or something like that. And then she took yeah, me yeah, to yeah. this uh, Sudanese place. And uh, it really, wow, this was a whole different kind of uh, falafel uh, experience. Uh, it's a really different falafel than what I know. They took a falafel with uh, sweet potato and uh, tomatoes with uh, peanut butter sauce. And it was, wow, amazing, amazing. That was, uh... so a person comes for the first time to Berlin. Uh, there are a few things that uh, they want to uh, explore. So let's go over the um, main things, you know, in short, I come for the first time to Berlin. Where should I go? What should I see? Where should I visit? Now, really, the first thing you should do is like really doing the center because like doing the main site, there's one beautiful walk. You can start at this famous gate at the Brandenburg Gate. That was the western border of the city. So there's a gate, a city gate. And there is the political center. There you can see the Reichstag, the German parliament building, and then walk from the Brandenburg Gate, this huge boulevard, we call it Unter den Linden, under the linden trees. And then you have on all sides, you turn um, on, the, on, on both sides a little bit, and there you have the main sites of Berlin. And then you end at the rebuilt castle of the Prussian kings, and then you end on Museum Island. So between the Brandenburg Gate and Museum Island, you have really the main sites of the old, of the, of the cultural center, of the political center. And there you have an idea of, you know, where Berlin started. These are the, the oldest building and then Museum Island. This is something everybody really has to see. The Museum Island still is under construction. So if you are not the biggest fan to go into the museums, doesn't matter. Just see the building, see this historical site of Museum Island. And then from there, you can do First, the Kreuzberg city center. Start at the place called Kot Kotbusser Tor. Every Berliner has a love-hate relationship with this square, which we call Kotti. You know, Kotti. And then you are in the heart of little Istanbul and you see something completely different. You really, you really do this, what we have, this rough, multicultural, but amazing part of Kreuzberg. And from there, you cross the bridge there is the Oberbaumbrücke, the Upper Tree Bridge. It's one of the, it's, it's the bridge between Kreuzberg and Friedrichshain. 
So there you have then this connection between the two party districts. And you start in Kreuzberg, you start with the, with the Middle Eastern scene, and then you go on the other side of the river, you go to Friedrichshain, and maybe end in Berghain, maybe end in one of those bars and places that are uh, the party scene of Friedrichshain. It's Friedrichshain, the youngest district, that's, that in the last five, five to eight years was the place where you say you move to Berlin, this is where you, you this is where you want to live. This is where you want to have your 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 first apartment and then of people move a lot, but this is only one side of the city. And then from there you go to West Berlin. You, you really you go, you have you, you have the classic center of West Berlin. You go down the Kurfürstendamm. That's the copy of the Champs-Élysées. You know, a lot of things in Berlin are copies because Berlin is such a young city. So you walk down and see all the, the Gucci's and Louis Vuitton's and go to KDV. That's the Harrods of Berlin. So this like luxury department store. And as I'm a, a foodie, a culinary tour guide, the sixth floor of KDV is something you have to see. Go there on a Saturday afternoon, have lunch there, and then just explore what they have to offer with seafood, cheese. They have a wonderful potato restaurant. And uh, really just just see this, uh, this, I mean, you have everything. You have French pastries, you have wonderful oysters, you have, like I said, very German stuff, but very international, lots of sweets, best chocolates in the world, the best pralines in the world. And yes, really, there, there you get an experience of what food can be. And you know, it's a luxury department store. And the highest revenue, the floor with the highest revenue is the food floor. Really? And so this is really something very, yes. So this is really something to, to, to explore a side of Berlin you wouldn't expect. The food court of the KDV, Kaufhaus des Westens, department store of the West. So then you have the classic center of West Berlin. So you have the old border, East West Berlin. You have the classic center of East Berlin, the cultural center, and you have the center of West Berlin. And then you really have very, very different sites, uh, very faces of the city, a three days experience. And this really gives you a good a good start for Berlin. Thank you. That's really something uh, good. It's really narrowed down to the heart, the beating heart. I remember that uh, when I was in Berlin, there was a very famous attraction to go somewhere outside of the city for an abandoned um, satellite, like espionage uh, base from the Cold War. It's a place where you have these yeah. uh, golf balls, <laughs> huge golf balls. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's, you know, it's, the, it's the, the, the devil mountain, the Teufelsberg. Teufelsberg is in, uh, you know, yes, we have a lot of forests inside the city. You know, Berlin is a big city with three big forests inside the city. I'm not speaking about the parks, but the forest. And the Teufelsberg is one mountain they built up after Second World War because they had to bring all this the old damaged building into one and forming a mountain out of it. And on top of that mountain, uh, the CIA was building their biggest espionage station to, to listen to what the, the East Germans have to say. And, uh, you know, after unification, after the American army left Berlin, it was an abandoned place. And it's really still abandoned. So it's a big, uh, it's very nice to go there and to see these, these buildings and sometimes they're really falling apart. A lot of street art there, but also just to, I mean, also some of the buildings are still in use. But, you know, the city is still not sure what to do with this heritage of the Cold War. And why is that? Yeah, you know, Germans, <laughs> Berliners are slow. <laughs> uh, I also remember another awesome place, which is today a park, but it used to be a very important um, uh, airport uh, during the Cold War. Uh, the mm. Tempelhof Field, I think. Uh, it's yeah, uh, correct. It's where they yeah. had the uh, air train, like the point of uh, air, uh, the airports is a big thing in Berlin. Not only, I mean, we had three when the wall fell. We had three airports. There was the old Nazi airport. This is Tempelhof. It used to be the biggest building in the world. It's a, it's a, it's a big round building. It's, it's a very strong. It's typical Nazi architecture. But, you know, this is in the, in the heart of the city. So it was clear. It can't grow. It's too noisy. It's too dangerous. So this airport was always about to close. And when the wall fell in 89, it was already in, in, in its last little steps. Then there was the West Berlin Airport and the East Berlin Airport. But also the capital needed a new airport. 
So first they closed Tempelhof, and then the Berliners decided, no, we keep this open field. We make it a park. We keep it. I mean, actually, we don't do anything with it. You know, it's just you. You can walk on the on the on on the, on the field where the airplanes were starting and landing, and you, you know, you. It's a it's a big open air. It, it's it's a luxury to have this big open air space in the heart of the city. It's a lot of a great place for picnics. But uh, just to, to continue this airport story, because it's such a it's such a shame. <laughs> you know, in Munich, a lot of people would say Berlin is a failed city, a failed city because they tried to build an airport. They tried to build a new airport and they tried to say, OK, we are closing the Western East Berlin airport and we're building something new. and uh, we needed 16 years to prepare and to build and to plan and go to the courts because everybody's suing against everything. And then we have six years of building. And then we needed nine years of fixing all the problems in the airport building. So the, the opening of the airport was nine years delayed. Nine years. A, a disaster. A big, the, yeah, biggest disaster that we have in the, in the uh, uh, recent history of the city. So I just want to say in uh, one sentence about the Tempelhof that uh, people will uh, understand. So the Tempelhof uh, became very important uh, during um, the Cold War uh, because, the, like we said, uh, uh, West Berlin was an island city, right? It was at the heart of Eastern Germany. And in order for the uh, Allied forces to bring supplies and all of that, they had a huge, not huge, I mean, yeah, a big, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. field to land all of the planes I, in one point there were so many planes planes landing there that they counted that each 45 seconds the plane landed in uh, Tempelhof and today it's just a huge park where it's it's in a um, octagonal shape i mean it's a uh, like almost a, a circle it's a circle yeah a circle it's a circle it's a, it's a circle yeah yeah and um and, and yeah circle sorry it's a circle and when uh, you go there so you have a huge uh, grass area where people sit with picnics and people are taking a stroll alongside what used to be the landing area for the airplanes and uh, yeah. i remember it's great uh, for roller skating yeah exactly exactly it's great for roller skating i i went there with my skateboard and i met people from <laughs> all over the world coming with their skateboards. Um, I, I remember I met this uh, American, uh, two, uh, two American guys, and uh, they asked me, for how long are you staying here in Berlin? I said, for a month. They said, oh, wow, that's great. And I asked, for how long are you staying here? And they said, oh, we are here for eight months. And I asked them, what are you going to do here for these uh, eight months? And they looked at me and said, partying. We're going to party. <laughs> 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 it's a very nice uh, answer. Yeah, yeah. And another thing I remember, but I have a feeling that it doesn't exist anymore. Correct me if I'm wrong. I went with a friend to this abandoned theme park, uh, which was also somewhere in the middle of a forest. But back then, people told me it's go they're going to take it down. So is it still there or is it? Now, this is the, uh, the Plenterwald. This is uh, the old uh, party ground for the for East Berlin kids and they have a Ferris wheel. They used to have like a, a nice theme park, but then it closed down. I think they uh, found a new investor that they say they're going to rebuild it. So I, I just know that there you can have like tours through the remainings of this uh, of the of the Ferris wheel. And of course, you are not allowed to go in. It's much too dangerous, but it's a uh, yeah, it's a. Uh, Exciting, but I'm not 100% sure about this, but I think they're going to rebuild it. So uh, that's the thing. I went there and I, I know people told me that uh, you're not supposed to do it because it's a uh, private property. It's dangerous. It's dangerous. It's dangerous. Things can fall down, yeah, yeah. but we went uh, anyhow. And uh, it ha you know, this experience was uh, like a zombie movie experience where you go in that uh, abandoned theme park and all of the shrubs are covering the facilities. And I remember there were yeah. statues, broken statues of, of the dinosaurs that their heads were uh, tilted down. It looked like a, like a war scene. And we went to the Ferris American wheel. American horror story. Yeah, exactly. It looks American, like a horror, uh, American story. horror story. Yeah. And we went yeah. to the yeah. Ferris wheel. 
and we touched it and it started to turn <laughs> and it's a huge ferris <laughs> wheel and then uh, some uh, yeah. guard uh, saw the ferris wheel moving around and of course he he spotted us he came to us and said okay you need to leave now and uh, we left but uh, that was something uh And it's also something I remember about Berlin that is uh, relating, related to what you said that the Bavarians say about Berlin, that Berlin is uh, not like a perfect city in the sense of like, it's kind of uh, broken. There are many uh, street art. Yeah, it looks like uh, very individualistic, mm. like people do kind of what they want. And I think it adds to the charm of Berlin. Yeah. Uh, but you know... Uh... A functioning administration sometimes helps <laughs> I mean you have to if you you know if you move to the city and you you become a citizen you know you, there are some administrative processes you have to go through you're waiting for some papers and you need these papers because you can't get a job you can't start your job without the paper and then you sit there and just wait for the paper wait and wait and wait and you you're calling them three times a day and say okay you just need a stamp and sign it yeah yeah we will do this and after some month or so it's you know you can say it's charming yes but on the other side it's nice when things are moving and functioning and working and especially everything that's connected to the Berlin administration sometimes you really say oh my I don't want to say something bad right now but you yeah, you know Sometimes you want to go to Munich and say, "Yeah, when things are working, it's nice. It's, it's, it's also a good part. Yes. Okay, Holger, I'm coming now to a fun part of uh, our episode. This part is called "The House of Fun." <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah, very important. House of Fun is basically where you recommend a certain place. It can be in Berlin or maybe outside of Berlin. For a weekend getaway, it can be like a retreat or something like that. So is there a somewhere nice in the city or around oh, yeah. it? yeah, to do like a an extended weekend yeah, or a yeah, weekend? Yeah. I have one of those places. you know when you when you think about a day, you know, I want to take a day off. I do always do it in early December, you know, when really you're very stressed, you're in high season, I really take a day off, and you really can't afford really that to travel far. You want to do something you have, you have these 10 hours and there's this one place called va bali va bali french go go to bali va bali it's french and it's really it's this it's a spa but it's it's a it's much more it's a huge space in the middle of the city so you really don't have to travel it's just beside the central station and you i i spent 10, 11 hours there. You go from one spa retreatment, from one infusion to the next. You have wonderful food. They really have. I, we have three meals there, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And you really think, I go, always go there alone. So it's like really you spend this day off anything. It's, it's uh, of course, no mobile phones are allowed. It's just, you know, and this is the, what I can say everybody, if you come, especially in winter, And you cannot spend a lot of time outside. you can't swim in all these lakes and all these you can't really use the 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 opportunities of Berlin in summer. Go there for a day and it's really it's it's an amazing place. It's called Vabali. It's very close to the central station and it's my absolute place of fun in Berlin where you can really say it's a full day experience. Wow, that sounds so good. sounds so good, <laughs> especially now in this time of year. So I'm getting now to another fun part of the episode, uh, which I'm already, I'm, go, I'm already seeing that it's going to be a bit complicated with, with Berlin, but we'll go step by step because <laughs> there's a lot to do there. Uh, and it's just called the bucket list. Okay? It's a bucket list of places that you recommend. I will just ask you and uh, shoot away whatever comes to your mind first. Sounds good? Yeah. All right. Cool. So favorite bar. Victoria bar Victoria it's, bar. Uh, I mean we have we have these fancy places, these places where I mean you have you know Bellboy, for example, Bellboy is from Tel Aviv. it's like they're, they're doing a lot of show around their cocktails, but you know when you have the place, when you really have like the real Berliners and also uh, a neighborhood that's a little bit up and coming I mean they, they used to have the prostitutes on the streets there, but now Victoria Bar in uh, Potsdamer Straße in uh, 
in, I think it's already Tiergarten. It's the border between Schöneberg and Tiergarten. So West Berlin, Victoria Bar is an amazing place, also with amazing bar food. Awesome. Great cocktails. Wonderful, wonderful cocktails. Best street food in Berlin? Yeah, between, you know, there's the, uh, I love the, this Don Xuan Center, this Vietnamese place, because it's so, it's, we have so many restaurants there, and we're, I still haven't tried all of them. And also Pakistani, Indian. So this is because it's not just one place, it's a lot of Asian places and right, really a lot of things to explore. Awesome. So I would always say, yes, I go to this Don Xuan Center. Okay, best burger in Berlin? Goldie's Smash Burgers. Nice. It's a uh, Goldie's is uh, a place that uh, brings you French fries with three Michelin star background. So it's really one of those. I mean, it's is it the best French fries place in Berlin? Uh, usually, you know, there are a lot of good places, but Goldie's and they opened the burger place, and the people stand in line for half an hour for a burger. For wow. a burger and it's a Smash Burger place. Okay, your favorite park in Berlin? I always would say the Tiergarten. Tiergarten. The Tiergarten is the central park of Berlin. Um, most impressive uh, museum? Difficult. <laughs> <laughs> we have, uh, I, I mean, most impressive museum always we will, will be the whole of Museum Island with these five museums. It's a, this is, like I said, it's the idea of the Louvre, like really giving you so much that you can't do it in one day. You need several days. Um, but I always would also say, because this is like the, the classic, the older part, and there is the old National Gallery. It's part of Museum Island. It's one of the five museums. But then, this is because this is old East Berlin, then there is the new National Gallery in West Berlin. So both National Galleries, they really show you a bright, a very big spectrum of arts, and the new National Gallery is is a symphony of Bauhaus. It's a symphony of modern of modern architecture and uh, from uh, Mies van der Rohe. So it's really, it's an amazing building. And I would always say the, the two national galleries together are uh, really, really uh, beautiful to see. Awesome. And a must see. Best hotel in Berlin. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, I, there is a, actually there is the Hotel Telegrafenamt. It's a, it's a, it's not the cheapest hotel in the world. Yes, I know. It's a, It's uh, in, in Berlin Mitte, this central district, and it's an old, it says, uh, it's an old part of the, you know, when you want to send a telegraph in the 19th century, this is where you go. It's a huge building. And uh, what is so nice about it, because the, the guys, it's, it's not a chain, the guys that were opening this hotel, they don't come from the hotel business. They come from gastronomy, but mostly from, uh, from restaurants. And it was their dream to open up a, a hotel. So all these details in the hotel, the bar and the restaurant are amazing. But the Hotel Telegrafenamt would be my recommendation today. Awesome. Uh, most romantic spot in the city? The Rosengarten in the Tiergarten. Awesome. There is one part in the Tiergarten, there is like a full of, there's a special roses area. And uh, I was just, uh, I was asked uh, by friends to say, okay, where, where can I propose? Where in Berlin? I can have the perfect surrounding. And that was, uh, was the idea. Yeah. Sounds romantic indeed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, best place for a picnic? Uh, we said that. Tempelhofer Feld. Yes. Tempelhofer Feld, because you're sitting there with hectares around you of, of free space. Yeah. Okay. So we are getting now to the last part of the episode, which is also a fun part, although all of the episode was fun and is fun. But uh, now we're getting to a questionnaire. It's, it's called the Bernard Giton questionnaire. Bernard Giton was a famous alpinist who worked mostly in the 40s and the 50s in, the, in France. And he used to ask uh, his uh, uh, travelers these uh, types of questions in order to get to know them a little bit. So um, this is more personal questions, but you know, in, a, in a good sense, in a good taste. So let's see. Yes. So your what is <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what is your favorite place in the city? There is a small park just around the corner. I live in Schöneberg. I live in the in this, this old city center west and there is 
uh, a small park here. It's called Victoria. Lu it's, it's not a park. It's, it's just a square. Victoria Louise Platz. It's a very, very small, but there's a big fountain in the middle. And people, a lot of people say, oh, this is one of the most beautiful squares of the city. I really love it there. So you just, you know, when I have a free time, an hour to just sit there in the sun, read a book. It's really nice. Your most favorite historical figure from your city's history? <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, that's difficult. I mean, with all these, all these figures, they all have so many good and bad sides. So it's always like, okay. I love our, the, old, uh, uh, the mayor that we had, the, the, the first gay mayor of Berlin who came out and said, okay, yes, I'm, I'm a very famous quote, I'm gay and it's a, good, it's a good thing. So he did so many good things for the city. He was the, the party mayor in, 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 the, in the late 90s and the early 2000s. But then he, he was one of the responsible guys who created the, the airport disaster. <laughs> so it's like, it's... Um, What was his name? Uh, Günther Wovereit. Uh, Klaus Wovereit. Klaus, Klaus Wovereit. Yeah. Your favorite German word? Gemütlichkeit. What does that mean? It's a bit, it's a bit like coziness, but you, you can't... The German word Gemütlichkeit is more like, okay, your, your inside in front of a, of a fire and outside it's snowing or raining, it's awful. And you feel like you have this coziness, it's warm, you, you, you feel you're, you're in, a, in a wonderful place with nice people and you just feel great. And this is the word Gemütlichkeit. It, well, it is really a, a good word indeed. Uh, okay, your uh, least favorite word in German. Attack. <laughs> zack, zack. I don't know. Uh, zack, zack. My least German word. In, in, uh, it's not really, it's not really a word, but it's uh, a lot of people always say, okay, when you want to say something bad in, in German, say, okay, yes, no, no, zack, zack. Uh. <laughs> okay, that, that works as well. Bureaucratie. Mm. That works okay. as well. So if you were not a tour guide, what other profession would you pursue? A DJ. Nice. Nice. <laughs> uh, uh, what other profession you wouldn't pursue? Working in the Berlin administration. <laughs> okay. If you were a plant or an animal, what kind of a plant or an animal, animal would you be? And why? I think I'd, I would be some kind of beautiful bird. Nice. A like kind of beautiful bird who can, is always independent and can fly. I wouldn't be a plant because a plant can't move and can't, you know, you can't really change your thing. Or maybe, maybe even, uh, a, 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 yeah, no, a bird. Uh, Holger, thank you so much. Uh, this was an absolute pre pleasure. <laughs> Uh, even I've, even though I've been to Berlin, I've learned a lot, and I'm really looking forward to come for a second visit to this beautiful city. So if uh, anyone wants to contact you and uh, hire you as a tour guide, uh, where they can find you? Yes. I mean, there is uh, my, my company, my website is The Taste of Berlin. And The Taste of Berlin, you have on one side, it's, it's more focusing. Yes, it's The Taste, so focusing on the on the culinary tours, but there you have all my contacts. And of course I can do any kind of, any kind of tours and but I'm going to show you around and show you the secrets of my hometown. All right. Holger, thank you so much and see you in Berlin. Matek, it's always a pleasure. Thank you so much for having this with me. And uh, yeah, well, looking forward to see you soon.